imagine yourself suddenly set down, surrounded by all your gear, alone on a tropical beach close to a native village, while the launch which has brought you sails away out of sight. Imagine further that you are a beginner, without previous experience, with nothing to guide you, and no one to help you, for the white man is absent. This exactly describes my first initiation into field work. Those words were written by a young Polish academic called Bronislaw Maranowski at the beginning of his famous account of native life in the Western Pacific. No one had probed so deeply into the lives of so-called savages. No one spoke with such authority. He was brilliant, dazzling, egotistical, controversial, and at the height of his powers. A generation of students were about to be drawn to his lectures from all over the world to learn his methods and hear his theories. I think he was the greatest British anthropologist ever was. He was so immeasurably superior to to Fraser, who was sort of thought of as the anthropologist in the previous era. Um, also, I think for a whole generation throughout most of my active career, uh, he established, as I said, this genre of how to do anthropology. Malinowski was born into an aristocratic family in Krakow, Poland in 1884. His father was a university professor, and he himself had a glittering career as an undergraduate, going on to take his doctorate in physics and mathematics. He was, however, much closer to his mother, and she read him pages from Fraser's The Golden Bough during a period of illness. These volumes had been read outside anthropological circles and had widely popularised the subject. They also inspired Maranowski to take a serious look at anthropology. He decided he wanted to uh, make contact with English anthropologists. Uh, particularly, uh, four names come to mind. Uh, Rivers, W.H.R. Rivers at Cambridge, and Haddon, Alfred Court Haddon at Cambridge, and at, uh, at London, at the London School of Economics, Charles Seligman and Edward Westermark. Malinowski arrived in England in 1910 in pursuit of a romance and anthropological training. He was admitted to the London School of Economics, where he was later to spend the greatest years of his teaching life. He was obviously seen as a promising student, as his professors raised funding for him to do further study abroad. The area he chose meant travelling by way of Australia, and for the next three years that country, already a centre for anthropological studies, was to play a prominent part in the shaping of his career and the destiny of British anthropology. When the British Association for the Advancement of Science held its 1914 meeting here in Melbourne, Malinowski was one of those who made the six-week voyage to attend. And in several ways, Australia was to play an important part in his life. He'd obtained his passage out here as secretary to the anthropology section of the meeting. The favourable impression of his early work on the family among the Australian Aborigines must have played a part in helping him secure that post. Aborigines were still the focus of much of the theoretical attention of anthropologists. But it was the calibre of the anthropologists themselves who were involved in giving papers and discussing the issues of the day that must have influenced the way that Malinowski was to approach his own field work. Haddon, who had engineered the Cambridge expedition to the Torres Straits, and Rivers, who had brought a scientific approach to anthropology with his work among the Todas, were both here. And so too was Baldwin Spencer, that pioneer of Australian Aboriginal studies, whose work Malinowski knew well. The collective experience of these great men and of attending the conference made Malinowski realise that the next important step for anthropology was a thorough, in-depth study of native life. Someone had to get to know what these savages were really like. After six weeks of listening and talking to the leading anthropologists of the day, Malinowski went out to the field. 
It had been suggested that he study the Mailu people on Toulon Island, so as the delegates headed for home and the grim prospect of a war in Europe, Malinowski left for his first attempt at field work off the south coast of New Guinea. Among the volumes he took along to read was a copy of that favourite handbook for those investigating native life, Notes and Queries on Anthropology. He had the latest edition in which William Rivers had laid out his special approach to the methods for collecting information. It's important to realise just how revolutionary a step it was for anthropologists to actually go and visit the cultures they were interested in rather than just staying at home, sitting in an armchair, rearranging other people's facts. Now they could go out during the day, witness ceremonies, find interpreters to interview the natives and come home in the evening and write up their notes whilst things were still fresh in their minds. Anthropology had, if you liked, moved from the armchair out onto the veranda. It was from a veranda like this on the island of Mailu off the south coast of New Guinea that Bronislav Malinowski did some of his early field research. It was the beginning of a life's work that was to make him one of the world's most important anthropologists. But he soon realised that he wasn't getting a full picture of native life from a perspective like this. In fact, he wasn't taking part in their daily lives. And he realised that to do this, he had to come down off the veranda and actually go and live with the natives themselves. My anthropological explorations absorb me a great deal. But they suffer from two basic defects. One, I have rather little to do with the savages on the spot. Do not observe them enough. And two, I do not speak their language. This second effect will be hard enough to overcome. With these two clear ambitions in view, having more to do with the people he was studying and learning their language, Malinowski decided to make a fresh start with a different culture. On a short voyage around the coast, he had been intrigued by the people of a rather remote group of islands called the Trobrians, off the eastern tip of New Guinea. In 1915, he made his base in the most important village on the largest of these islands. In this village called Omarakana, which has no signpost and which is well off the beaten tourist track, Malinowski's career as a modern field worker began and with it was to come a new energy and momentum for anthropology. It was here, just under those palm trees, that he pitched his tent, and it was from here that he began to describe and understand what mattered most to the people whose lives he decided to share. Soon after I established myself in Omarakana, I began to take part, in a way, in the village life, to look forward to the important or festive events to take personal interest in the developments of the small village occurrences, to wake up every morning to a day presenting itself to me more or less as it does to the native. I would get out from under my mosquito net to find around me the village life beginning to stir, for the people well advanced in their working day, according to the house and also to the season, for they get up and begin their labours, early or late, as work presses. As I went on my morning walk through the village, I could see intimate details of family life, of toilet, cooking, taking of meals. I could see the arrangements for the day's work, people starting on their errands, or groups of men and women busy at some manufacturing tasks. <laughs> Quarrels, jokes, family scenes, Events usually trivial, sometimes dramatic, but always significant, form the atmosphere of my daily life as well as of theirs. In the ordinary course of this tribal life, the children, who always play in the evening, band together to amuse themselves in the central place of the village. Malinowski obviously enjoyed the company of the children who followed him round the villages. 
and he must have fascinated them. One of those children was Babwao, who still remembers Malinovsky's impact on the village. Malinovsky was looking at Trobriand life to find clues about how all societies worked. His observations led him to the conclusion that all aspects of social life were actually designed to serve basic human needs, such things as food, shelter and reproduction. Serving those needs was the function of every social act and institution. And this way of looking at things became known as functionalism. The functional method recognizes, perhaps above all, that the satisfaction of biological needs implies and develops a system of derivative requirements. Man, living under conditions of culture, obtains his bread indirectly through cooperation and exchange. He has to procure it in complicated economic pursuits. Culture, therefore, creates new requirements for implements, weapons and means of transport, for social cooperation, for institutions which ensure an ordinary and lawful working of human groups and which allow of organized cooperation. Malinowski was not so interested in how things had evolved, a problem that had obsessed so many of his predecessors. He believed that what was important was to look at how society actually worked at the time it was being observed by the anthropologist. Take marriage, for example. Uh, the older anthropology was focusing on what was the origin of marriage, what was the evolutionary relationship between marriage by capture and marriage by purchase and marriage by exchange, you see. Was there such a thing as group marriage? Was there such a thing as primitive communism in women, you see? And Malinowski said, in essence, don't talk nonsense I mean, about this. Let us focus on what is here and now. Let us explore the biological aspects of marriage, the legal aspects, the economic aspects, the aspects of relation of social groups and kinship, the symbolic aspects. And so he, all the time, this was a plea for further and further exploration. Any aspect of social life could be approached using the key question, what does it actually do in society? For example, Malinowski found one particular thing permeated most parts of Trobrian life. Magic. Magic. The very word seems to reveal a world of mysterious and unexpected possibilities. Partly because we hope to find in it the quintessence of primitive man's longings and of his wisdom, and that, whatever it might be, is worth knowing. Partly because magic seems to stir up in everyone some hidden mental forces, some lingering hops in the miraculous, some dormant beliefs in man's mysterious possibilities. The fact that the Trobrianders resorted to magic intrigued Malinowski, mainly because the events which provoked magical behaviour were those at which they were really expert. There were magical rites for each stage of the gardening year, magic for fishing, there was even love magic. There was a magical accompaniment for almost everything. 
Sivua matu ila lima watu iti la kawadu Watu iti la kawadu bilikuwa ya kabulu wa giurutu wa kaisa buwa na ayo mara Tolu ala kwe kwa mikumesi kwa ila kusake maulu wa kawadu ya uji but Malinowski wondered why they needed magic spells and rites to accompany technical procedures at which they were so expert. For example, the Trobrianders were, and still are, proficient gardeners. Their livelihood depends on the yam crop, and individual status also comes into play with the distribution and display of food at harvest time. In fact, there's a lot at stake in the gardening year. Magic is seen as necessary for the favourable outcome of the garden crops and to exert a control on the weather. Magic is so much a frame of mind for the islanders that even an economics graduate like Jerome who will one day be paramount chief of the Trobrians, thinks of magic in a way that Malinowski would recognize. Magic is like your fertilizer. So our fertilizer is magic to make our crops grow very well. And you don't see any conflict in learning spells and about herbs? It doesn't conflict with your idea of science at all? No, no, not at all. Two different things altogether. Science is founded on the conviction that experience, effort and reason are valid. Magic on the belief that hop cannot fail, nor desire deceive. The theories of knowledge are dictated by logic. Those of magic by the association of ideas under the influence of desire. Malinowski was now tackling fieldwork in a more sophisticated way than even he realized at the time. Every day as he wrote up his notes, he began to paint a picture of native life that was very different from that portrayed by his predecessors. It was more complete. How did he manage this? Just what was it about his own approach that made his work so much better than that done by previous anthropologists? People like Rivers, for example. Well, for a start, he spent a long time in one place. He was out here in the Trobrians for just under two years, and for most of that time, he was in close contact with the natives. But the real breakthrough, though, came because he communicated with these people in their own language. He was a very able linguist, and there's no doubt that he spoke Kirwinian, the local language, with great fluency. In his letters, Maranovsky noted with amusement how the islanders reacted to his anthropological pursuits. He wrote to his fiancée, Elsie Masson, By the way, I was known before as Nasauna Amarakana, the man from Amarakana. Now I hear myself announced by the term Toli Labogwo, the man of the old talk, or to put it nicely, the master of the myth. There is, of course, no reverence associated with this designation. Indeed, it implies rather something like that chap who is dotty and on the point of old man's talk. This style of fieldwork, speaking the language fluently, living with the community, keeping detailed daily notebooks, came to be called participant observation. It was tough and demanding work, and it was also intensely lonely. We know this from the letters that Maranovsky wrote and from the personal diaries that he kept when he was out here in the Trobrians. I well remember the long visits I paid to the villages during the first weeks, the feeling of hopelessness and despair 
after many obstinate but futile attempts had entirely failed to bring me into real touch with the natives or supply me with any material. I had periods of despondency when I buried myself in the reading of novels as a man might take to drink in a fit of tropical depression and boredom. These diaries make fascinating reading. They tell of the rigors of field work, of the doubts, the achievements, the failures and the irritations. But they also show that he took time off to relax with a rather interesting group of expatriates who lived out here at the time. Among them, the pearl trader, the doctor and local magistrate and the merchant. It's clear from the diaries that his friends provided more than just a social refuge, for they too had important insights into the workings of Trobrian life. Ironically, it was the missionary to these islands, not Malinowski's favorite species of colonial, who had recorded an important ceremonial activity that was at the source of Malinowski's fame as an anthropologist. The Trobrianders call it the Kula. <laughs> Early in 1915, in the village of Dikoyas, I heard conch shells blowing. There was a general commotion in the village, and I saw the presentation of a large necklace. I, of course, inquired about the meaning of the custom, and was told that it is one of the exchanges of presents made when visiting friends. At that time, I had no inkling that I had been a witness of a detailed manifestation of what I subsequently found out was Kula. Maranovsky soon realized that this exchange called Kula involved no ordinary presence and was between rather special friends. So much of what you can observe of native life seems boring and dull just because you don't initially know what on earth is going on. And to begin with, Maranovsky was in the same position. Impressionistically, it makes you feel that you're at an enormous fair or garden party. This latter is even for me a better comparison because a typically English garden party seems to me always entirely pointless and inherently tedious, quite as much as the Kula. I can understand from the outside why people indulge in what, but subjectively I could find happiness and joy in neither. It didn't take him long, however, to realise that the Kula was at the centre of Trobrian life. Kula means to go and reflects the fact that these exchange ceremonies were the final act in a vast tribal enterprise which involved elaborate and dangerous expeditions. Each cooler expedition is launched with the aim of returning back with a particular set of valuables. Either arm shells called Mwali like this, which has just come back from Katava, or necklaces like this called Sulava. To us as outsiders, they're just rather strange pieces of native jewellery. But for the Trobrianders, it's more than their appearance that matters. For these people, these objects are venerated. They each have a personal history and a name and a renown of their own. These valuables can't be bought or sold. They have a worth that isn't estimable in simple monetary terms. They are, in fact, rather special items of exchange and they're at a centre of a ritual that involves a whole ring of islands out here in the Western Pacific, of which the Trobrians are just a part. The Kula is carried on by communities inhabiting a wide ring of islands which form a closed circuit. Along this route, articles of two kinds, and these two kinds only, are constantly travelling in opposite directions. In the direction of the hens of a clock, moves constantly long necklaces of red shell called sulava. In the opposite direction, move bracelets of white shell called mwali. Each of these articles, as it travels in its own direction on the closed circuit, meets on its way articles of the other class and is constantly being exchanged for them. Every movement of the Kula articles, every detail of the transactions, is fixed and regulated by a set of traditional rules and conventions
The cooler is still at the centre of Trobriand life and requires months of preparation. It all starts with the building of a special cooler canoe. Expeditions leave today just as they did when Malinovsky stayed on these islands. There's a special magic for each stage of the cooler. Here it's performed to forestall any disasters that might happen on the journey. The rites go on today exactly as they did when Malinowski recorded them. <laughs> The aim of each cooler expedition is to return with one or more of the venerated objects and the focus of each trip is the handing over of the actual necklace or arm shell. Each voyager is heading for the village of his cooler partner where he will wait around as a rather special guest until he is reluctantly given the object of his anticipation. He will hide any sign of excitement or gratitude, as he will one day have to reciprocate with a valuable of equivalent worth when his partner calls on him. It is like, rather like a game of chess or some such game. Your object as a player is to possess, if only for a short time, one of these named highly valuable objects, which are either necklaces which are going around that way or arm shells which are going right that way. And there are still, even today, some named arm shells and necklaces which Melanovsky actually mentions in his book, which are still circulating. The cooler also provides an opportunity for trade in other objects, mostly the sorts of things you can't get at home. It's a time for keeping up old friendships, and maintaining contact with neighbours who very often have different languages and cultures. It's an enterprise in which the whole community have taken part, and the folk back home eagerly await evidence of the expedition's success. What was the bargaining like? How many arm shells or necklaces are there? Are there any famous ones? All the trophies are carried triumphantly from the shore across the island, in this case, to the chief's village. A famous named object that has been circulating since mythological time arouses a strong desire for possession. But what do you do with these priceless objects once you've seduced one from your appointed partner? Most people have to offer them to their chiefs. Famous necklace or arm shell, then I will have to pass it to Waibari. If I kept it, it means I'm challenging him. Famous objects usually goes to top pip chiefs. So he's the chief. If I kept it, that means I'm challenging him. Because that 
necklace or the arm shell is very famous. And it should belong to the What chief. happened if you held on to it? Why body would poison It poisoned you. Is that through magic or by direct poison? By magic. Magic is still a fundamental part of Trobriand life, and the chief is expected to be a leading exponent. The paramount chief today is Waibadi, a conspicuously successful magician. He is held responsible for any fortune or misfortune that befalls his people. With this responsibility goes the honour of receiving the best spoils of any cooler expedition that he sponsors. <laughs> Some of those ancestors were actually recorded by Malinowski singing their traditional songs. The recordings he made using wax cylinders have recently come to light. They're a fascinating glimpse into the past. When we played them to Boabao, he could name the original singer and still sing the song. One of the things that really interested Malinowski about the Trobriand Islanders were their myths, the stories that they told to explain how things were in olden times. It's said that the ancestors of all the Trobrianders used to live beneath the ground. It's also said that the original ancestors of each of the tribes and clans came up to colonize the Trobriand Islands through that cave. The oldest myths describe events which took place just at the moment when the earth began to be peopled from underneath. Humanity existed somewhere underground since people emerged from there on the surface in full decoration, equipped with magic, belonging to social divisions and obeying definite laws and customs. But beyond this, we know nothing about what they did underground. Oh, this is fantastic. Quite a lot of evidence of human ancestors up here, but apart from a few bats, I can't see any of the original totemic animals, nor any evidence of the people who originally came up from under here to populate the surface. However, the current paramount chief, Waibadi, claims he can trace back his ancestors, something like 75 generations, right back to the original people from the underworld who came up to live 
on Earth. While recording life and death in the Trobrians, Malinowski suffered his own loss. His mother, to whom he'd always been close, died. Mother is no more. My life pierced with grief, half my happiness destroyed. All the time I feel grief and desperate sadness, such as I felt as a child when I was separated from mother for a few days. I resist it with the help of shallow formulas. I close my eyes, but the tears flow constantly. A feeling of the evil of existence. I think constantly about the shallow optimism of religious beliefs. I'd give anything to believe in the immortality of the soul, the terrible mystery that surrounds the death of someone dear, close to you. This is one of the more remote and traditional villages. These people are in mourning. Recently, one of their close relatives has died. Mourning out here is not just an inner state. There are certain outward signs to express just exactly which members of the family are in mourning. They shave their heads, they cover their body in ashes, they wear dark clothing and wear the beads of mourning. It's said that when someone dies, their baloma, or spirit, goes to a place called Tuma. It's an island off the northwest coast. It's obviously a Trobriand heaven. Life is very much the same as it was on Earth, but people are much happier. They carry on their gardening, their fishing, their singing and their dancing, and of course, all the associated magic. And needless to say, life is one endless round of cooler expeditions. The world of ancestors is never far from Trobrian thought. People here feel that they have a real contact with their dead friends and relatives. To become an ancestor, you don't, of course, have to have lived that long. This song tells of a young lover who has died and gone to Tuma. <laughs> Maranovsky was like a breath of fresh air on all the subjects that anthropology tackled in his day. Topics like exchange, myth, ancestor worship, religion and the family. He swept away old theories and filled the gaps with a startling amount of well-ordered information. But there was one topic that he tackled in a particularly interesting way. The sexual habits of the islanders. He didn't just report that the girls were more beautiful and that they wore fewer clothes, or that the men were unusually promiscuous. Like most Westerners, he was intrigued by these topics, but he was beginning to know Trobrian life well enough to realize that sex, like all topics, had to be viewed in a much wider context. Malinowski had more than just a passing interest in sexual matters. For most of his life, he had a reputation as a womanizer. But when it came to considering sex among the Trobrianders, he saw it in a much wider context than just the different habits and customs that surround sexual intercourse itself. For him, the anthropologist, the whole topic of sex included the various social consequences that arise from the physical and emotional attraction that men and women have for each other. 
Malinowski's work on kinship, marriage, courtship and sex went more deeply into these aspects of native life than the work of any previous anthropologist. In this matrilineal society, uh, sex relations appear between unmarried people appear to be very easy. Therefore, this implied that sex relations in our society ought to be, ought to be very easy. There's a lot of non sequiturs in the, in the argument. But certainly he came to be seen as a crusader for a, well, what later came to be known as the permissive society, very liberal, loose living, you know, very uh, libertarian view of, of sex relation. <laughs> He wrote a book with the lovely title Argonauts of the Western Pacific. Now, the very title. You know, I mean, it, glamour is sort of written into the in title. Third one was battle with the Freudians and had sex and repression in, in savage society. And then he really capitalised on it with a book called Sexual Life of Savages in Northwest Melanesia. Now, this was playing the game. You know, he was meaning to be attract publicity. Uh, the sexual life of savages is not terribly... It's not pornographic, really, but it may appear pornographic in those days. Certainly in this university, it got on the banned books right away. Like it or not, the topics that Malinowski wrote about caused quite a stir. Basically, he relished the attention. The customs and even the sexual habits of the Trobrianders were now the subject of drawing room conversation. He believed very much in putting anthropology on the map. He saw himself very much as somebody who, who wanted to make this new science n known and accepted. And he, for instance, he uh, broadcast on the BBC on such subjects as marriage. He had a, de a de debate of several programs on marriage with Robert Briefo. He talked on religion. He made people aware of anthropology in a way which was not up till then usual. I think some anthropologists uh, disapproved of this strongly. They thought it was a vulgarization, but that was certainly not his motive. Malinowski had married Elsie Masson, the fiance of his Trobrand years, and they had three daughters and formed a close family. Basically, he was a very moral man. He believed very firmly in the good old-fashioned values, friendship, loyalty, truth at the sort of uh, put it all on the table level. And he expected uh, loyalty and he gave loyalty. Uh, in that sense, he was a man of quite definite moral convictions, but much more than that. As you know, he wrote towards the end of his life uh, quite a bit about freedom. And the book Freedom and Civilization, published after he was dead, does, I think, convey very much Malinowski's own uh, rendering of this. Malinowski welcomed his students to his house in the Italian Tyrol, where theory and methods were always topics for discussion. When his wife died in 1935, he went on a field trip to Africa to visit some of his students. They were in the process of doing field work in several different locations by closely following his methods. Through these students, he exerted a strong influence on the emerging field of African studies. He also found time to do some anthropological survey work himself among several African tribes. It was during this period of extensive travel that he developed an enthusiasm for a better understanding of peoples directly under colonialism. He was a 
very strong critic of anything that could be regarded as colonial exploitation. Uh, he pointed out quite firmly in 1938 how the Europeans had taken so much from the Africans and given very little in return. How there was an asymmetry of relationship in everything from church to home to political affairs and so on. The Europeans were in the superior position and the African in the very inferior position. He had in his seminars people like Kenyatta, who afterwards became president of Kenya, Alison Davis, one of the most distinguished American black anthropologists, and others as well. Ralph Bunch, who was in the United Nations later, was in his seminar. And these people, I think, respected him, and he respected them, and at that level, I think, was always willing to challenge uh, any colonialist uh, ideas. Malinowski had become an exciting and controversial figure, and his company was sought in fashionable circles. A major source of his reputation were the seminars he gave at the London School of Economics. I was teaching about administration in Africa, and somebody said to me, you can't possibly teach anything about Africa unless you attend Malinowski's seminar. So I duly did so. And then I became, you might say, hooked on anthropology. It was a, an extraordinary, like no other seminar I've ever attended anywhere. Uh, people were nominally entitled to give, asked to give papers at the seminar. If they got beyond 10 minutes, this would, they'd be doing very well indeed. Malinowski would then interrupt, and you would be charging off on some completely different hair. It seemed at the time very strange it seemed as if you never knew what direction it would go in or why. But as I've been looking back and thinking over it, of course, it was much more structured than one imagined. It was directed towards, um, well, getting us to answer questions in a manner that showed we understood his theory, which he must have sometime, of course, have put across during the seminar. Evans Pritchard called it, guess what I'm going to say next. The direction in which their thinking will take, for it presents the same... In 1984, students of those famous seminars gathered at the London School of Economics to commemorate the centenary of Malinowski's birth. ...euphoric anthropology. For students of Malinowski's, and there are several here this afternoon, that this is a very significant and even a touching occasion. Malinowski's fieldwork has been generally regarded as providing a prototype for modern anthropological field research. And I think this is correct, though not in the way often imagined. It has been argued by Gluckman, by Evans Pritchard, even by Edmund Leach, that Malinowski's essential achievement in fieldwork, the source of his strength and originality, as one of them put it, was to have lived for a long But it wasn't only his students who adopted his fieldwork methods. Today, there are anthropologists working all over the world who conduct their field research along the lines that Malinowski laid down, living for long periods with remote peoples, learning and speaking their language, sharing their lives, and appreciating their values. In 1923, when Malinowski was offered a permanent post here at the London School of Economics, he chose the title. He was to be reader in social anthropology. That distinguished it from the much broader discipline of cultural anthropology, already being taught to a second generation of Americans by Franz Boas and his students. By the end of his life, Malinowski himself had influenced a group of remarkable students. They carried on this emphasis on the study of the social aspects of human life. And that has become the focus of British anthropology today. Bronislav Malinowski died suddenly of a heart attack in 1942 he was 58. He had just accepted a post as professor at Yale and had also started to do more field work, this time in Mexico. In England, his influence had been crucial to the modernization of anthropology. 20 years earlier, it was his vision of a goal which suggested that anthropology was about to enter a new phase. The final goal of which an anthropologist should never lose sight is to grasp 
a native's point of view, his relation to life, to realize his vision of his world. Mm -hmm.